Morning. Uh, welcome to St. Mark's United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Ken. We have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, starting 
uh, to say Happy Mother's Day and to all the ladies in our congregation. We wish you have, will have a very happy day today. We also have some poems and information in honor of our mothers uh, printed in the bulletin. Uh, also, there's a new upcoming Bible and Prayer Fellowship on Sundays, May 16th and 23rd at 3 o'clock. Uh, we'll be meeting outside, weather permitting. If it should rain uh, or bad weather, we'll come inside. But uh, please bring a lawn chair and a mask. And this is an attempt just to, uh, to study the parables, to have something uh, new for our, our congregation. Uh, also, there's a information about a webinar on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, which um, needs to have our attention. So please read, read that announcement as well. Are there any other announcements at this time? If not, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord our God. Please stand if you are able for the call to worship. Welcome home. God, God bids us to come. Find rest for our weariness. Find, Find peace deeper than our worry. worry. Welcome home. All you lost, wandering, or stuck in despair. Welcome to God's arms as wide as a father's hair, as warm as a mother's love. Let us now join together in singing our opening hymn, number 92, for the beauty of the earth, verses 1 through 4. sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Prayer is the key to assessing the power of the Holy Spirit within you. You open your mouth and your words. You open your heart and reveal your concern. You unite with the Spirit in the knowledge He will answer you. In its most simplified form, that is prayer. Prayer is talking to God. The moment we begin talking to God and making our needs known, we are accessing the power of the Spirit. As the psalmist wrote, when I pray you answer me, good hearts hears us and begins immediately to help us with concerns in our lives. That's why we talk to God about everything. He listens, he cares, 
and he works for us. Heavenly Father, today I ask you for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Lord, please enable me to live the life to which you have called me. Amen.
they'll let us join in the hymn. Happy the home when God is there. scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give praise for this Mother's Day Festival of the Christian Home and for all the women in our congregation throughout the world who love us each and every day. As we come and worship, let us honor our mothers and all women in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's kind of interesting, the history of celebrating mothers. It was after the Civil War that an anti-war movement was started by the poet Julia Ward Howe, and she developed throughout the country a Mother's Day Peace Day to honor peace to have peace within our country and throughout the world. But then it was in 1905 when a daughter whose mother who died, Ann Jarvis, died on May 9, 1905, 
wanted to pay tribute to one woman, her mother. It began in West Virginia at Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church. And there in 1914, President Wilson had a national holiday, the second Sunday in May to celebrate Mother's Day and women of our country. I'd like to read a poem from Proverbs. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that she shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the, the staff. She stretched out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed and with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates while he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but no, thou excellest them all. Favor is, deep, is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that fear, feareth the Lord shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. When we look at that from Proverbs, it's a very interesting uh, verses of Scripture. But yet it applies to all women. You know, when I drive through Lancaster County to visit our daughter and her family, I'm always amazed when, especially on Thursdays out in Amish land, I notice women cutting the grass, hanging the clothes, baking, all these things for their family. It's amazing to see them on tractors, to see them plowing the fields. Many of the husbands are, and the boys are out working in trades with carpentry and building things, and they take care of their home. What is so interesting when we begin to look at our scripture lesson this morning is that we look at Jesus, the true vine. In the beginning, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard. It goes on later to say in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. It was kind of interesting as I was preparing the Mother's Day and Festival of the Christian Home, I came across some really good examples. It's good that we come here on Mother's Day and Festival of the Christian Home to honor our mothers and all women of the church. Phil Keith, the former police chief of Knoxville, Tennessee, tells of receiving a call from his mother while he was in the middle of a televised press conference. He was there televising, telling his viewpoint about a particular case that had occurred when one of the people came up to him and said, excuse me, sir, but your mother's on the phone and it's an urgent message. He excused himself from the television broadcast for a moment and he went to the phone and as he picked up the phone, her, his mother said, are you chewing gum? He said, yeah, mom, I, I am. She said, well, it looks awful on television. Spit it out and go back and finish your conversation. Well, you know, I thought that was a really good example. 
But then, as we begin to look, it's not easy to be a mom or woman in our, in our world today. But most of us have learned to appreciate the many sacrifices that have been made in our behalf. Jesus told his followers, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Jesus' words are the model for all mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, as well as children, siblings, and friends, because God loves us and we love one another. Because he forgives us, we forgive one another. At the center of the gospel is the self-giving, loving God. Notice from our text the link between love and happiness. Jesus says to his disciples, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be complete. Notice that that is essential to true happiness. As we begin to look in 1938, a group of researchers at Harvard had a study of adult development. The study, which included interviews with over 700 men, began in 1938 and has been going on for nearly 80 years. The goal of the study, which was begun during the Great Depression, is to discover what factors throughout a man's life are the best predictors of happiness in later life. As the study began to go on, many of these were in their late teens, and one man was in his 90s. So what did they discover about the secret to happiness? The director of the Harvard study summed it up in two sentences. Happiness is love, full stop. The quality of men's closest relationships with others was the greatest predictor of happiness in later life. Let me say it again. The quality of the men's close relationships with others was the greatest predictor of happiness in later life. Everything else was a distant second. You see, Jesus served as an example of this truth more than 2,000 years ago. Even when he knew he would be misunderstood, people would reject him and fail him, he still chose to love us to the cross and beyond. In the Bible passage, Jesus is trying to share a life-changing truth to, with us, that love is essential for happiness and joy. But Christ had another point to make about love. Love requires sacrifice. He explained it like this. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Few of us will ever be asked to die for the people we love. But to love people in the same manner that God loves them, we got to lay down our selfishness and our prejudices and our grudges and sometimes even so-called rights. It can take a lifetime to recognize and lay down all barriers that stand between us and loving like Jesus loved us. It was a few years ago on Action News that there was a story about a young man named Jermaine. There was a fire in an apartment building, and Jermaine climbed 15 stories outside of the building to get to the apartment where his mother was living. When he got there, he was able to signal to the fire people where he was. They were able to get a ladder up there and to rescue the mother and to rescue him. And what is kind of interesting, an officer told Jermaine that he could have been arrested for his actions. You just don't climb buildings. But he said, I'll let you go with the warning. As Jermaine said about his mother, she's not surprised by the things that he did for her. She knows that he would go above and beyond. There's another story in China in 1942. A man fell in love with a woman and he decided to build a cabin on the top of a mountain. Now there was a lot of ridicule about this marriage because he was much older than his bride or, or new wife. And so he decided that in the side of the mountain he would carve steps. He carved 6,000 steps so that she could get safely to the top of the mountain. This is a true story. It took many years, but he showed so much love for his wife that he was willing to take that sacrifice so she could climb the mountain and not be hurt. You know, there's been a lot of studies made recently, and especially during this time of COVID, 
where I think we're going to have to kind of rethink and reintroduce ourselves to each other. Let's face it, by wearing masks and we meet new people for the, new, for the first time, we don't see their face. We don't know who they are. There's a store that I go in occasionally, and I, I got to know the, the people that work behind the counter, and we got talking one day, and the conversation came up about the mask. I said, you know, we really don't know what we look like. And so for a second, we took our mask and we lowered it, and we were able to see each other's faces. Over the past year, we only saw the eyes of the people. Notice how we react to each other. The first time we meet someone for the first time, what do they do? Did you get the shot? Are you gonna wear your mask? Which shot did you get? Did you get the P&J or, or which one? How long ago? Also, did you get sick afterwards? You see, we're gonna to have to reinvent ourselves when we get back to normal. One day when we won't be wearing these masks, we'll be able to socialize with each other. It's gonna be a whole new awakening for a lot of us. You know, one of the things that happens a lot of times during these difficult times, that we develop anxiety or there's difficulties that we have in our, in our hearts where we develop an opinion that just really weighs us down. Well, the thing that we have to do when we have these anxieties and these things that happen in our life is to develop tools to help us to deal constructively of what's going on. How can I reframe it? How can I change my idea? How can I move forward in life? There's another true story in the sixth century, a monk named Dorotheus. In the monastery, the monks weren't getting along. They were fighting with each other. And one day he drew a big circle and in the middle of the circle, he put a stone. And he said to the monks, I want you to go around the circle. And then the stone in the center represents God. And I want you to reach out to the center of that stone and to allow God to touch your lives. And as they were doing it, they were noticing that the monks next to them took on a whole new atmosphere and a whole new way of looking at each other. And the hostilities in the monastery began to fall down. Well, some of the things that we learn in our scripture lesson today, number one, we love because God first loved us. We love because God first loved us. Secondly, we can love all God's children with a love that approximates the love we have for our own children. The love that we have for our own children should spill out into other relationships in our world. Thirdly, to remain in Christian love. Always remain in Christian love. Fourth, we are to love each other as he has loved us. Did you ever stop to think for a moment the love that Jesus had for us when he went on the cross? The sacrifice that he made for the sins of the world. He took on the responsibility of reaching out and saying by dying on the cross he was doing his father's will and by dying on the cross he opens the pathway for eternal kingdom of God now one of the things that I was kind of stunning over the past couple of weeks was Methodist history and a couple of things I found I looked up the word love in the Oxford University dictionary there was a whole page on defining love. But there was a little section there about Methodism. And it talked about the love feast. Now, what is the love feast in the Methodist church? We, we, ha we haven't done that recently, but I can remember that when I was growing up. When there wasn't an elder to have communion, especially after the American Revolution when a lot of the priests went back to England, it was lay people. And they said, well, since we can't administer communion, we'll have the love feast. So they took a little bun, 
and they took some tea or they took some water or juice, they would form a circle and they would partake of the juice and they would take the bread and hand it to a person and say, take a piece of my bread. And they would share and have testimony. The love for you. I was shocked when I saw that in the Oxford University Dictionary about the love feast uh, with Methodism. But also I went to look further. Uh, a lot of our theology is Arminianism, which means that our job is to go out and to bring people into the kingdom of God. That it's not preordained like in Calvinism, that it's not predestined. But we can go and regardless of what a person has done, we can bring them back into the fold. And simply to say, and I'm gonna, you know, right now, like 80% of Americans say that they're godly. Only f about 45% are affiliated with the church. But if you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you just can't do it alone. The next step is to go into a Christian fellowship and to be part of a Christian family. We really need to emphasize that point. Wesley believed that very strongly. Be part of a Christian fellowship. You say, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Well, become part of a family that will help you enrich that and go further. All of us, as we come here and we worship today, we need to give thanks to the women of our church and our country and our world. Because let's face it, many of our churches would not be here if it wasn't for Methodist women and other societies. They just wouldn't be here. There's one church in Philadelphia that I pastored, Siloam United Methodist Church. To build that church, the women of the church, every Friday made pepper pot soup. And when I went in the basement of that church, I could still see the pots in the kitchen. I could imagine the women coming there every Friday, making this soup and then selling it. A church was built with pepper pot soup. Well, that was one of my favorite soups growing up, but it's hard to get now. If you go into the supermarket, you, you probably won't find pepper pot soup. Campbell's used to make it, but it's not made anymore. And there's other examples of Methodist women with the money that they raise for mission and the work that they do. And on this day, it's important for us to give praise to the women of the world. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, on this Mother's Day, Festival of the Christian Home, we honor our mothers and all women as we lift them up in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing our next hymn.
commit you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Let us now depart in thy name.